Good evening. How is everyone doing? Welcome to our virtual Gallier gathering. We are the Herman Grima and Gallier Historic Houses. I'm Dr. Anastasia Scott. I am the Director of Educational Programming here. Gallier gatherings are being offered to you for free in this virtual platform. If you like our programming, please become a member. Membership has its perks. If you are not a Louisiana or New Orleans resident, you can take advantage of the North American Reciprocal Museum Association, where you can receive membership benefits with museums and cultural institutions across the United States, Canada, Bermuda, El Salvador, and Mexico. Membership also helps with sponsoring programs such as this. If you join now, your membership is good through the end of November 2021. If you are impacted by COVID-19, we are offering student memberships for $25 through November 2021. We are now open for self-guided tours. Please uh, visit our website to book a tour. The background behind me is our wonderful courtyard, as you can see, <laughs> at uh, the Herman Grima House. So our online gift shop is participating in Museum Store Sunday on November 29th. You can receive 15% off most items using the code Museum Sunday 15 all caps. We stock primarily women owned vendors. It's a great alternative to shopping the big box stores on Black Friday. And we have really cute gifts, by the way. So Introducing to some and um, just presenting to others, Herman Grima and Gallier Historic Houses is managed by the Women's Exchange and it aims to preserve and maintain the architecture and decorative arts of the homes so they may act as a microcosm of life during the 19th and 20th centuries and to inspire educational experiences and discourse around our collective past and its contribution to the culture of New Orleans. At the end of each Gallier gathering is a survey we send out asking for your feedback. We would like to inform you that this speaker is the result of your requests. Please know that we read your feedback and try to make this content as relevant as we can. So please fill out the survey we send out after each Gallier gathering. Your feedback is valuable. For his talk, Afro-Creole Poetic Activism in Civil War Era New Orleans, Dr. Clint Bruce will examine how Creole activists in Louisiana fought to establish racial justice through their French language poetry that articulated their vision and how we can read these works today. Clint Bruce is assistant professor at the University of St. Anne in Nova Scotia where he holds the Canada Research Chair in Acadian and Transnational Studies. His research focuses on Acadian diaspora, on Francophone identities in Louisiana, and on the Francophone Atlantic world. A native of Shreveport, he holds a doctorate from Brown University, a master's degree from the City University of New York, Lehman College and two bachelor's degrees from Centenary College of Louisiana. His work has appeared in numerous journals and his previous translations include works by T. Mayhart Dardar, Karen Cose Bell, and Jean Arsenault. The topic of his talk is based on his new book published by the Historic New Orleans Collection. <clears throat> 
titled Afro-Creole Poetry in French from Louisiana's Radical Civil War Era Newspapers. The link to purchase his book will be shared in the follow-up email sent 24 hours after this talk. Additionally, this talk will be recorded and also available for viewing in 24 hours. So just a bit of housekeeping before we commence. Questions should be submitted using the chat feature. I'm sorry, not the chat feature, the Q&A feature at the bottom to your right. If you have any questions at any point during the lecture, please save them until the end or submit using um, the chat feature at the bottom of the screen. Without further ado, I present to you Dr. Clint Bruce. Thank you so much, uh, Anastasia, for that introduction and, and, and Tessa for overseeing everything. Uh, it's an honor to be here. We'll jump right in. Uh, since last week's election, an image of Vice President-elect Kamala Harris has gone viral. Uh, you've probably seen it, created uh, by artist uh, Bria Gweller in collaboration with the t-shirt company Good Trouble. It shows Senator Harris striding along a concrete wall onto which she casts a shadow much smaller than herself, one instantly recognizable to many thanks to a painting by Norman Rockwell as the silhouette of Ruby Bridges, the first African-American child to enter in 1960, a desegregated school in New Orleans. So one effect of this poignant composition is to remind us of the nearness of the United States brutal segregationist past. Not too many decades separate the achievements of Bridges and Harris, the latter born merely 10 years after the former. So indeed, when, when we think of the struggle against racism and for equal rights, we immediately associate that struggle with the campaigns and victories of the 1960s. Here we have a photo uh, from the March on Washington in 1963. My presentation for this gallery, gallery gathering is going to take us back a century prior to the uh, very roots of the civil rights movement. In the 1860s, French-speaking Creole activists in Louisiana fought to establish racial justice as the nation went to war with itself and slavery ultimately crumbled. Belonging to the community of free people of color in New Orleans, they adopted a radical posture in solidarity uh, with the formerly enslaved population. Two successive newspapers, L'Union, the Union, founded in 1862, and America's first black daily, the New, the New Orleans Tribune, La Tribune de la Nouvelle Orléans, played a key role in this mighty struggle. So my talk today, as Anastasia um, mentioned, is gonna examine how the French language poetry published in these two newspapers uh, articulated uh, their vision. And, and it's also gonna explore how we can read these works today. So here's what I'm gonna try to do over the next hour, besides convince you to buy my brand new book uh, from the historic New Orleans collection. Um, I, would, I hope that you're gonna come away from, from this presentation with an appreciation of the role played by French speaking Louisiana Creole activists, political activists and community activists at a crucial juncture in the history of the United States. Um, through literary creation um, uh, as a way of understanding their society and their place in it. So that's one thing that they were doing. They also used their writings as a vehicle for imagining the world as they wanted, wanted it to exist. Um, so that's something we're gonna talk about a lot, projecting the future through um, literary creation, through poetry. So that's, that's, those are, that's one objective. I also wanna persuade you, and I'm sure a lot of you out there are already convinced uh, that the contributions of these Afro-Creole activists uh, deserve to be fully recognized and incorporated into the historical narrative and into our intimate comprehension of how our own world uh, be became what it is today. And on a secondary note, while I'm sort of hawking my, my book, to, uh, the, the book that I've uh, translated and presented today, I also want to give you uh, a glimpse into some of the fantastic scholarship over the last couple of decades that has been produced on this unique and fascinating 
community. And I'll tell you probably during the discussion session how I'll let you know some uh, other books and other resources uh, in addition to Afro-Creole uh, poetry from Louisiana's radical Civil War era newspapers. Okay, so I'm gonna go back into my uh, PowerPoint here. I'm gonna toggle back and forth. So here's uh, sort of what the next uh, uh, 55 uh, minutes and hours is gonna look like. We're gonna do some context and some background on the newspapers and then on the intellectual tradition that's feeding this activism and literary creation at the time. I'm then gonna talk about uh, my job, putting the book together and translating 79 poems into English poems, that, that's the goal. Um, uh, that'll be the third part. And then in the last chunk of the, the talk, we're gonna see some examples, some poetic activism in action. I'll wrap up with a quick conclusion because I'll be eager to get to your questions at that point. So just to make sure everybody's on the same page, um, and if there are uh, folks out there who are not familiar with Civil War uh, history and Louisiana's uh, place in that history. So we're talking about um, uh, the 1860s, as I mentioned earlier, when uh, 11 states broke away from the United States of America to form uh, their own nation, the Confederate States of America, with the explicit goal um, of enshrining slavery as a way of life and ensuring the expansion uh, of slavery. So this is a, a, a breakaway nation founded on uh, oppression to justify a social and economic system. So the, the, the war lasts four years, as many of you know, and the period that follows, but it sort of overlaps, is known as Reconstruction. So the South is defeated, the Confederate States are defeated. We, you know, most of you know this, just making sure we're all on the same page. And, and for the next, uh, really over the next decade, there's gonna be a, uh, a program, a series of programs put in place to hopefully reinvent US society after slavery. This is a hope for a post-racial world, as we said, uh, after 2008, after President Obama's election. Louisiana is gonna be a, a laboratory, a very important laboratory, because early on, New Orleans uh, and the lower Mississippi Valley, the river parishes are liberated or occupied, depending on how you wanna look at it, um, by the federal army. And this is the context in which the Creole activists are going to start um, to organize themselves. The reconstruction itself after the war ends and slavery is put to an end happens in two phases that historians call presidential reconstruction when first Abraham Lincoln and then Andrew Johnson were largely directing matters. And a second phase um, after dissatisfaction that I'll get into later um, known as radical or congressional uh, reconstruction. Um, so there are, this is a period of great promise it's also a time of upheaval and ultimately a very bitter disappointment as uh, the nation in the South specifically is gonna slide into, into segregation, United States form of, of apartheid. Um, the great American historian, Eric Foner has called Reconstruction America's unfinished revolution. And he justifies that statement in his book of that title by, by stating that like the American revolution, Reconstruction was an era when the foundations of public life were thrown open from discussion. Uh, for, di for discussion. And the great African-American sociologist W.E. Du, du Bois puts it tersely, um, the slave went free, stood for a brief moment in the sun, then moved again, uh, back again towards slavery at the end of Reconstruction. Um, we're going to look, look at what's going on in Louisiana at this time with a little bit of dem demographics. So around the outbreak of the Civil War in, in 1860, um, there are about, uh, there are a little over 31 million people in the United States, and there are almost 4 million enslaved people. There are about half a million free free black people, um, what were called free colored in the census, and we're, we say in Louisiana context, free people of color, uh, gens de couleur libre uh, in French. So I've got two graphs up here that show the total population of Louisiana and the population of the city of New Orleans from 1860. So the total population of Louisiana is a little over 700,000. And the blue and gray, that's not the north and the south, that's what my Excel generated <laughs> the colors for, uh, for this graphic, are the free white population, which is um, pretty much half, and the enslaved population, which is almost half. And, and so that's why when we start to, you know, we talk a lot about minorities and minority rights, in much of the south, African Americans are not really a minority. Um, there, and, and uh, I'll 
develop that a little further. Um, the orange slice that you see in the middle, that is uh, Louisiana's 18,000 free people of color, most of whom were French speaking, had roots in the colonial period or um, in Louisiana or in colonial era Haiti in Saint-Domingue. A couple of weeks ago, my dear colleague, Angel Adams Parham uh, discussed those connections with Haiti. New Orleans is a little different. Uh, New Orleans is uh, one of the biggest cities in the South after, after Baltimore. Uh, there aren't a lot of big cities in the South. Um, a city like Atlanta is basically kind of almost a dot on the map at this point. Um, Baltimore is bigger than, than New Orleans. It's a city of, of immigration from Europe out of 170,000 people, 66,000 are foreign born, Germans, Italian, Irish. Um, it is not home to a lot of enslaved people. That's uh, the gray slice that you see that you see there. Um, it is home to an important uh, population of uh, free people of color. It's about half of the state's population around 10,000. And so I don't at all want to minimize the role of slavery in New Orleans. Um, and in fact, there are many links between the free people of color and the enslaved population, which we'll get to later on. So this is sort of the demographic lay of the land. And if we look at the map on the right, um, taken from a book on reconstruction by Ted Tunnel, we see that there are many areas of Louisiana, mostly along the Mississippi River and the Red River, so sugar and cotton producing districts that are majority black. Um, and in some, in some parishes, up to two thirds, uh, two thirds of the population after the war is going to be formerly en enslaved, freed. On the ground, this, as I mentioned, is a time of upheaval and can lead to strife. This, this goal of integrating African-Americans into the nation's life, not as enslaved people, but as citizens. So this, this uh, drawing um, that's published in a national magazine uh, is shows a Freedmen's Bureau official, Freedmen's Bureau set up an agency of the federal government, set up schools, handled complaints, labor contracts for formerly enslaved people, and was supported uh, in its work by, um, by the, the, the newspapers uh, in, in New Orleans. So he's sort of holding two, you know, two crowds apart. Um, and you can see that he's really trying to protect uh, the African-American men behind him from these white men and that violence will ensue. He's standing in front of American flag. It's all very symbolic. Um, So the newspapers are um, founded in 1862, but a few weeks uh, after the Union Army um, occupies New Orleans and basically Confederate officials are either surrender or are chased away and, uh, and you know, sort of fly up, up river. Um, so what you see here on the, on the screen is um, the, the image is the first page of the, very, of the very first issue of the Tribune, which is the, the second paper. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, L'Union, which started out only in French and it is founded by three um, men, Louis Charles Houdanet, um, who is a physician by training. He, his brother, Jean-Baptiste Houdanet, and their editor-in-chief, Paul uh, Trevigne, who's an educator at an influential school for children of color, l'Institution Catholique des Orphelins Indigents, uh, located in the Faubourg Marigny. And so when they start this paper, their goal is to help this radical transformation that Louisiana society and the nation needs to undergo. And the very, one of the very first editorials by Paul Trevigne, it's the sentence um, in French that I'll read for you in English, states that they are on the cusp of a revolution. And Trevigne writes, without fear and without anxiety, we initiate today a new destiny in the, uh, uh, a new era in the destiny of the South. Some of the issues that they're, um, that they're looking at are um, promoting um, and recruiting uh, black, uh, black soldiers, African-American soldiers uh, for black units, the very first black units in uh, the United States military, the native guards. Uh, the papers are going to be advocating for proper labor conditions for the formerly enslaved. And both papers and the journalists and activists around them will be engaged in heavy political organizing through the Republican Party of Louisiana, which is founded uh, at this time in the mid 1860s. And that includes campaigning for the right to vote. Um, the paper uh, tests its political muscle. Um, so I'm talking about L'Union 
1864, when uh, two delegates, Jean-Baptiste Houdinet, one of the publishers, and Arnold Bertoneau, traveled to Washington uh, to meet with President Lincoln and present to him a petition that's signed by uh, a thousand men of the, the free community of color advocating uh, for the right to vote, not only for them, but also for the formerly enslaved. Lincoln's in, uh, he's impressed, but it doesn't change things uh, right away. It takes a little bit more time. So coming back to, uh, to my slide here, but what happens with L'Union is very interesting. These men were risking their lives every day under threat of death, uh, under threat of arson, and things had reached ahead by the, by the summer of 1864. So they decided to shut L'Union and found the Tribune, La Tribune de la Nouvelle Orléans, um, a mere couple of days later. And La Tribune, as I mentioned, becomes um, the first a black daily in the United States. It's going to reach a national audience. And the um, sentence that you'll see at the top is a letter um, from the great abolitionist and social activist Frederick Douglass, where he tells the editors, it was it's printed in October 1865, that he reads the paper and he's proud that a press so uh, true and wise is devoted to the interest of liberty and equality in your Southern latitude. So one thing to know coming in, uh, if you're interested in the poetry or the history of these papers uh, in and of themselves, is that you're going to encounter some extraordinary, exceptional, and impressive individuals. They are talented, they are resourceful, they are community-minded. Here are two of them. Um, one of them is uh, the uh, the publisher, Louis Charles Houdinet, um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, he's trained as a physician. He studied in Paris and at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. Um, he was born in St. James Parish, a little upriver, to, to a Frenchman. His father was from France. His woman was a free, a free woman of color. Um, and he studied in the, in the late 1840s during the Paris, the French Revolution of 1848, which was heavily socialist in nature. Um, and during that revolution is when France um, abolished slavery in its colonial territories, which really impressed uh, activists and the community of, of color in, in Louisiana. Um, so he returns to Louisiana later on with that fire that we're going to talk about. Uh, the second man is a Belgian. He is, he is a European, um, um, Jean-Charles Uzo, who is a scientist, he's a mathematician, and in 1848, around that time, he loses his job at the, at the um, Belgian Royal Observatory because of his radical political opinions. So he decides to leave Europe, he wanders around the United States, um, and he starts, he's, he sees everything that's going on, and Uzo is a progressive despises oppression and he despises slavery. He starts to correspond um, with, with the papers and he is offered the job of editor in chief. And Uzo really um, uh, works hard. He is tireless. He churns out hundreds of editorials. He's not the only editorialist, but he is up before dawn and he's working into the wee hours for four years. And he, who, he is the one who really, he is one who really makes uh, the Tribune into a, into a national uh, paper. Um, a couple of other notes there. Um, we're getting to a point, um, certainly in New Orleans, where um, some, some uh, community uh, historians and researchers have done some fantastic work making this legacy known. A couple of years ago, there was a plaque inaugurated um, uh, at the Tribune's offices, one, one of their locations, which is right next to the historic New Orleans collection on Conti Street. The three folks you see there are Marc, uh, Marc Houdani, um, one of Louis-Charles Houdani's uh, descendants, um, genealogist and historian Ajari Anora and, and Barbara Trevigne. So we see here some names of folks who were associated. And there's a website um, dedicated to um, Louis-Charles Houdani's legacy um, that I encourage all of you to visit for photographs and all sorts of, of documents. So this is fantastic. And I'm hoping that my work contributes to, the, um, you know, to this thrust that we're seeing. So what the, these activists and journalists and poets, as we'll see, are aiming for is largely achieved in the Louisiana Constitution of 1868. We don't hear enough about this, so I'm hoping this really stays with you. Um, through sort of the turmoil and organizing in Reconstruction, 
it becomes very apparent that right, the rights of formerly enslaved people, of the African American um, and, and, and Creole population of color are going to need to be firmly grounded uh, in constitutional law. I'm gonna get back to that struggle a little later. Hopefully we'll have the time. But uh, March of 1868 is when uh, one of the most visionary constitutions of the, of the time after the Civil War um, is adopted. And you can see sort of a list there um, of some of the rights that are guaranteed. It states that all men, uh, it is very much focused on men at this point, are created free and equal. Um, citizenship is recognized without regard to race, a color, or previous condition of servitude. It's a guarantee for free press. Um, discrimination is outlawed, including in businesses and transportation. And the vote is guaranteed to all um, men. Um, school, the public schools are supposed to be integrated and several of the folks around the, the two newspapers are involved in that. They're on school boards, uh, commissions in New Orleans. Uh, so these are all very positive developments. From the cultural point of view, it is interesting that um, there are folks like me who are very, um, you know, very committed to the French language aspect who also point to um, the decision to make English really the official language and, and, and banish uh, French after decades of, uh, you know, really bilingualism, official bilingualism. Um, on the right, you see a poster that was produced at the time that shows some of the African American uh, convention members. Arnold Bertoneau, I mentioned earlier, who was involved with the Tribune and traveled to Washington, he was in the Constitutional Convention. Um, uh, and so there's real black leadership that emerges and uh, a number of the poets in, in, in the book uh, are, are involved in political positions. So they are activists, they become politicians in addition to their literary activities. So the next um, the next section that I want to move into is is thinking about well where are these folks coming from they they're Americans but they're but they're writing in French um, <laughs> what does that mean and there also is a lot of you who um, I'll stop my share for a minute a lot of you who know New Orleans history or the contemporary lay of the land um, may be aware of a lot of hmm, how can I say um, ideas floating around about the free population of color, that there was this, there was this elite class that uh, it could be very disdainful of um, African-Americans, that there was sort of a, maybe this color distinction that is certainly you know, very real and has been studied. Um, and and there's also a legacy of um, many of those descendants, you know, passing into the white population either by moving away, um, uh, changing some of the stories of their family history because of discrimination as a strategy. So um, looking back at the activism that I'm interested in, a couple of hypotheses have emerged. Thinking about what what, what was this community going to do this this New Orleans community of 10,000 and and their leaders how are they going to position themselves um, after the Civil War during during Reconstruction um, a couple of weeks ago Angel Adams Perham talked about the racial palimpsest this layering of the American racial order where you're either black or white onto the Creole racial order where there's really three categories and three people of color um, were often of mixed heritage. Certainly not always, you know, not always. Um, so how are they gonna navigate this? And historians have come up with a couple of, uh, couple of different hypotheses. Um, so I'm gonna go back to my share here. Um, some early researchers um, uh, decided, um, I don't wanna say decided, concluded is a better word, that whenever the, the Creole elite in New Orleans was um, taking a stance for broader civil rights, that they were really doing it out of, out of self-interest, but that they were largely conservative um, and that they wanted to protect their standing. In the 1990s, there emerged another thesis, really looking at the more radical aspects of their, not only their, their discourse, what they were writing, but some of their practices, um, largely through a book by historian Karen Casse Bell that I use as well. That's how I kind of frame the poetry that, dis, that talks about the Afro-Creole protest tradition in Louisiana. And so she frames them as radicals, drawing from a, a number of ideological and intellectual traditions that I'll discuss in a minute. Um, a quick note, um, community members by and large do not refer to themselves either then or now as 
Afro Creoles. It's very much a term that researchers have used, and it's not one that I would ever want to impose on, on people and say, you should identify as Afro Creole. Um, historians uh, really made it more popular. Um, Bell, as well, as well as Gwendolyn Midlow Hall, and her fantastic book on the African legacies of colonial Louisiana, um, started using it because Creole really meant uh, the colonial population and its uh, the, and the cultural. Um, uh, cultural identity and practices that, are, that emerged from it to, to this day. And it's not a racial definition. It's, it's cultural and it's also linguistic, either French or, or Creole, Louisiana Creole speaking. Um, and you can have any number of, of, uh, sort of racial identities and blendings within that Creole culture. Scholars have wanted to focus on, okay, what is really um, it's either, either, either African or is drawing from, from the black perspective. And so we are using that. And if people want to use it to apply it to themselves, that's okay. But I wouldn't want you to, anyone to think that because I'm using it, anyone has to identify like that. It's more of a scholarly term. Um, so there's this conservative idea um, that that's what the elite's doing to protect their standing. And, and the idea that no, these are, these are actually really radicals and they're visionaries. My answer actually is sort of yes to, to both in some ways. I've sort of leaned towards the radical side, but there are new, um, new approaches to identity that we can characterize as postmodernist. I don't want to go into that. Um, basically, that uh, recognizes that our identities shift. Uh, they're not essential elements of our being necessarily. Um, they can change because um, society's definition change um, uh, for strategic reasons so that our identity is not at a fixed point. Um, it can shift with, with society. And so some of the scholars that have worked on this community, and there I'm drawing from the work of Tulane historian Justin Nystrom, um, others who have really looked at the Tribune's writers have talked about their, their writings, saying that what we can see here is this Creole group deciding that they are going to be black. Um, and that's not to say that I'm, that's not a judgment or passing on them, but saying they, they sort of had some choices here and they really made the conscious decision to say, no, we are casting our lots. And I have uh, uh, with the, the African-Americans in general and, and uh, race may be a construct. It may be something political, these categories we didn't decide, but we're gonna use them. And I have a, a quote from a wonderful essay by Carolyn Center from 20 years ago, um, where she says that the, the poets that I study and have translated um, recognize that race was a construct that had been used against them through discrimination, and they were going to use it through an alliance at that point. Right? Um, so moving on, so this 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 protest tradition. What what, is, what does that mean? So we're really looking at a convergence of elements in the culture and also uh, the education of free people of color. So their experience culture and intellectual traditions and therefore their, their education that shaped their worldview and therefore informed how they were going to act and help to organize their community and also produce beautiful, astounding literature. At least that's that's my viewpoint, right? Um, so you have a list here. I'm really drawing from Karen, uh, Karen Bell's work. Um, um, she looks at practices of resistance by, by enslaved people. What did they do to survive under the brutal system of slavery? So that's one source of inspiration. Um, and also, you know, just sort of the cultural richness that was brought uh, by Africans and blended with other cultures that, you know, that was, that was you know, sustenance to survive, sometimes literally by, through food ways, right? Um, so that's one element. Another is under the Spanish regime in the late 18th century, free people of color developed a military tradition. They were formed into militias. They later fought in the Battle of New Orleans and then in the Civil War in the Native Guard. So there's this real pride around that. They also looked to radical thought in Europe in the Enlightenment and specifically in France and Republican ideals as they were expressed um, in uh, the definition of the rights of man through the French Revolution at the end of the 18th century. And the French Republican motto, Liberté, Égalité, Fraternité, resounds throughout the two newspapers and throughout the poems. There are actually several poems where you'll find those three terms in capital letters. They're really there. Okay, um, so as they're thinking about the Republican Party in the United States to which they belong, they're also thinking of French republicanism, right? A, 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 repub a republic of equal citizens. However, there's another more sort of racially grounded element in Haiti, in the Haitian Revolution, where many of, of um, 
of the Creole uh, population has roots from which um, their parents had, had fled simply because of the violence uh, from Saint-Domingue. Um, and many of them remained in contact with their cousins there. The Tribune and L'Union published dispatches from Haiti. They had correspondence there. They were people from Louisiana who moved to Haiti and wrote back. This is a real tie. And so that's that radical anti-racist universalism is an inspiration to them. A couple of other elements that are European but are really adopted and transformed are romantic um, philosophy and literature, um, the expression of the, of the self, authentic expression. Um, on the rational side, many of them become Freemasons. And on the mystical side, um, you know, we think of New Age religion as something that came out of the hippie age, uh, you know, in the 60s and 70s. Um, that is very much not the case. The 19th century saw a number of new religions um, and uh, in sort of a first, I'd say, less radical turn, there were forms of dif dissident Catholicism in New Orleans um, because of dissatisfaction with the church hierarchy and conservatism. And beyond that, a number of free people of color joined a new religion called spiritualism um, that swept across Europe and across North America and even into South America, and whose main practice is communicating with the dead in seances. Okay? Um, I'll come back to that. Um, maybe one, one final note before I start to talk about the, the, the translation work and the book itself. Um, 1862 is a watershed in Louisiana for freedom of speech. Um, freedom of speech, yes, it is in the First Amendment of the Constitution, but it did not exist as we know it really until the 20th century. Um, the First Amendment refers to Congress, right? Um, up until the 1920s, in some landmark Supreme Court cases, states could pass all sorts of censorship laws. And an 1830 law in Louisiana, uh, which you have there on the screen, specifically stated that Printing, writing, printing, publishing, or distributing, distributing it says anything <laughs> that would produce discontent among the free colored population or insubordination of, among the slaves uh, could uh, result in life imprisonment or the death penalty. Um, so we're talking serious fear of free speech. Um, and so what f free people of color, um, you know, Creole writers were very, um, uh, active as literary producers, and we have a number of, of traces and texts, but they weren't publishing a whole lot. They were in their own social, social clubs, mutual aid societies, and they were reading to each other. We have a couple of publications um, from the 1840s. One of them is uh, the first example of um, uh, anthology of Black poetry in, in North America, Les Senel, or the May Haws published in 1845 by one of the poets who later printed in, in my book, um, Amon Lanus. Who, um, so they're really almost underground um, until 1862 um, when they can start printing their newspapers and publishing their poetry in their, in their newspapers. Okay. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the writers in this book. There are 79 poems in Afro-Creole poetry in French from Louisiana's radical Civil War era newspapers. Um, there are several writers about whom we have a lot of information um, and they're, they're easy to identify and they've left a, a, a sort of a public record. So what you see on the screen here is on the left, you see writers for whom there are actually biblio uh, biographies in, in, in my book, um, in, in the back. Um, and there's a lot known about them. And you have the number of poems that they contributed to the corpus. So a couple of things are gonna jump out at you uh, right away. One is that Adolphe Thuard, who was born in 1830 and lived till 1908, he contributes massively. He was a teacher at the school that I mentioned earlier, uh, earlier the Catholic Institute, known as the Couvent School, after the, the widow um, whose um, bequest allowed it to be, to be founded. He's a teacher there, and a number of these writers were involved as teachers at this school in Faubourg Marigny, where they, where they you know, educated um, in their Afro-Creole protest tradition um, uh, generations of um, uh, of free people of color, and then after the Civil War of, of, of Black uh, young people in, in New Orleans. He writes a lot. Um, hopefully I'll get to talk a little bit more about him later, but he's a teacher, he's also a playwright, um, he's an actor as well, and he has deep family ties to Haiti. 
Um, some of the others are fairly well known to historians. And at the bottom, there are some, there are some white poets as well. Jean Gentil, a French immigrant who had a newspaper in St. James Parish. Henri Train, who's a lawyer from, from Martinique. Um, he, is, he is white. And then the last name is an interesting case you'll learn about if you read and buy the book. Um, Victor Eugène McCarthy, um, a man of color from a very well-known family in New Orleans, pulled off a literary hoax under the pen name Anthony, uh, which was based on his stage name in one of Alexandre Dumas' plays. And I discovered this almost as we went to press, uh, reading a fantastic article by a young his, uh, historian, Bill Horn, on McCarty and his um, civil rights activism in, in 18, uh, after the Civil War. And um, uh, Horn talks about his poems. We had actually had some conversations as he was working on his article, and he mentions that it resembled a French poem that he found. And I actually discovered that he recopied five poems from French journals and publications, gave them new titles, and passed them off under the name of Anthony. And I've kept them in the book because it's really interesting the effects that happen. And I'm pretty sure that people in his the circle of writers were sort of in on it. Um, so that's something you can learn more about in the book. On the other side, there are some writers uh, who are anonymous. There, there's not a name given or their names that I, I cannot identify um, despite lots of trying. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about how I've organized the book. This is kind of what you're gonna see in the table of contents. I have the cover the cover up here. Um, the, the poems, 79 in number, uh, take up, you know, obviously the, the main part, but the rest of the materials around it are sort of a small book within the larger book. Um, my historical introduction, which I'm drawing on for much of this presentation is about 60 pages with a lot of images. Um, there's a foreword um, by my colleague, Angel Adams, uh, Param, who's a specialist of um, uh, Creole identity and society in, in New Orleans. Um, as, um, I, I do have some essays, that, uh, a shorter essay that discusses my translation and also working with the texts. Um, and at the end, there's a section of, of biographies that run from a couple of paragraphs to a couple of pages. Um, and so what I want to talk about here is how I've organized the poems. So these are almost 80 poems, and depending on um, what you would include or not, over 80 really in the papers. Um, I won't go into justifying why some uh, poems in the papers aren't included. There was an earlier book almost 20 years ago done by a researcher, James Cowan, um, published in Europe, uh, where he collected most of, most of them, did a really nice job with some beautiful drawings, a great essay. The book is largely unavailable now, and it's not, and they're not translated either. Um, and he presents them sort of throughout, um, uh, how can I say, sort of in a flow. The poems were not printed in the paper as a coherent body of work. They appeared over nine years. And so whenever you gather them, you're sort of creating them as as a body of work. I mean, so there could be months go by without, without a poem. They, no one was sitting with a master plan of saying, we're gonna sort of create a collection of poetry. They're coming from these different writers who wanna write about something that's, that's important to them. And I wanted to um, present them in a way that has the most impact today and foregrounds what they're doing with this role of reimagining the world after slavery and projecting um, a vision for what they want to see. Now they do lots of other things, right? So I, I decided on some themes with a lot of discussions with my editors. Uh, my editor, Margaret Longbreak and I did a lot of back and forth uh, on this, on how to organize them. And I came up with five sections and you can see that in the, in the graph. Um, so they start with poems that discuss the role of poetry. Poetry is prophecy. And I'm gonna give an example of that in a minute, a very clear one. There are poems that deal with uh, topical events. So I've entitled The War and Reconstruction. There are 10 poems in that category. Um, there are also, there's a section of poems more broadly about um, uh, political and social issues and specifically racial equality, so social justice. There are also poems that are philosophical in nature. And I've given this sort of title, The World of Ideas. It's kind of a catch-all, um, but I think that it, it holds up. 
Um, finally, there's a, there's a mass of poems, 28, that are sentimental poems. They're not all love poetry. Some of them are po poems of, of friendship. Um, and so one of the reasons that I wanted to foreground the political poetry, the, the more hard edge, is because if you sort of uh, put the poems all together in chronological, or chronological order, the sentimental poetry sort of takes over. Um, that's not bad per se. It, it, it really does some important work. Uh, but I, again, I wanted to just talk about the more militant aspects. That's the thrust of how I'm organizing, organizing the book. So let's look at what I mean by poetry as prophecy. I do not mean, I need to back up a little bit, I do not mean predicting the future with a crystal ball. That's not what prophecy means here. Prophecy refers to something that the poets were very conscious of, and that is the biblical role um, that the prophets, the Hebrew prophets had in denouncing injustices and in foreseeing for damnation <laughs> of, uh, of, of those problems in the, in the world. And this came very much uh, back into sort of into the four in the 19th century when poetry in France, in Europe, romantic poetry uh, was seen as a, as a force for social change. And there are a number of poems that really describe, okay, what is poetry here going to do? Um, so I've taken, um, I've taken an excerpt from a poem by, by Duar, the most prolific poets, uh, that's called Poetry uh, Vox Dei, Poesie Vox Dei, from that expression, the voice of the people is the voice of God. Poetry is the voice of God. I'm going to read from my translation, and then I'm going to talk about my own philosophy as a translation. This is going to be my example. This is from a little later, it's a, it's a longer poem, so I'm reading. What joyous uproar is it that strikes our ears? A people, disgraced, awakens from its fears. O oh, poet, reclaim your lute. All fetters are smashed. Servitude's shame shall end, and slavery will finally vanish from our land. Freedom, freedom we salute. So sing to soothe those souls filled with disquiet. Revive the songs of our lyres, fallen quiet. The future seems less dark. In tones prophetic, profound, and pure, now sing of the blazing sun, which ere long will be shining upon us with hope's spark. So one thing to take away is that he is discussing his role as a poet. What is he supposed to do? He sees these changes. The fetters are smashed. Slavery is ending. And it is his time to write in such a way that inspires the enslaved and inspires solidarity with them. And he uses the word in French, poétique, right? Prophetic, okay? We're going to herald the future. So I wanna discuss a little bit my approaches for translating this, this, this poem. Translating poems involves um, a reading of them. It's an interpretation. You could translate these poems or any poem dozens of ways. I'm going to be very honest with you folks out there. Um, a sonnet, 14 lines, sometimes took me eight to 10 hours. It's a lot of work. And in fact, 10 years ago, when I started discussing a translation project with my editor, I did not want to translate poetry because of that reason. Um, and it ended up becoming a labor of love over, over a decades, in part because I, I respect these, these heroes um, so much. Um, and, and the other reason is that I see the relevance for this work today in the moments of Black Lives Matter, um, in the moments of all of this, you know, these questions that we have about the past that are not resolved, um, and about problems that, that we're, you know, that we're facing in North America and, and elsewhere. Um, so I'm going to get back to, to translating. Um, I had to ask myself really uh, two questions. So why were these poets writing and why should we be reading them today? So why were they writing back then? What were they trying to do? And what's the point of reading them now? So why they were writing back then was largely to inspire their Creole community. Now, if they're writing a love poem, you know, they're, they're writing for, you know, there, there are various reasons why. I'm thinking sort of in a, in a, in a thrust, right? In the, in the main thrust. Why we should read them today is because for one, I believe these works have real literary value. These are some good writers and they master the codes of French poetry and they're not imitating French poetry. They are full partakers in a Francophone literary world. I fully believe that. They're not 
copying, imitating, they are masters of their art, right? By and large, certainly Duao, several others, okay? Um, so when I wanna translate an Engl a poem into English, I have to make it an English language poem. And someone who doesn't read French, doesn't know French, has to be able to step into that poem, into that construct, live in it and breathe in it and experience it. And that is a guiding principle. Now you can read more about the translation theory and all that in my, in my essay, but it has to be a poem that you can dwell in and that can live in your soul. Um, it, if, you, if I do that, then it succeeded. So what that means is that um, when the poets were writing, they mastered their art, their craft and their art. And so I have to write an English language poem that's had that, that demonstrates some mastery of English language poetics, which is hence the eight to 10 hours and you know rewriting, staying up late, uh, late, uh, late at night, all of that. So I'll go back into this, um, into this example and show you just some of my choices in the second, in the second stanza, right? I've done a lot of work here with, with some sibilants. So sing to soothe those souls filled with disquiet, revive the songs of our lyres, fallen quiet, these S sounds that aren't quite as present in the French, right? Um, so something you may ask is, can I sort of read alongside and have a sort of, you know, follow word by word? For many lines, yes, for, for others, no. Um, and, and there are very few stanzas where you'll look at the English and go, okay, well, what's going on with, you know, versus the French, but there are some where I had to, to create an English language poem. I had to take some real liberty, right? Um, uh, to achieve uh, what's, what's called in translation theory, analogous effects, okay? So something, some things that I've done here, I'm gonna take a, take a sip of water. Um, so the line, in tones prophetic, profound, and pure. I've done three plosive, these, pr these p sounds that microphones don't tend to like, right? To show the role of poetry kind of breaking through. That was done on purpose. I chose, you know, it's there in the French a little bit in poétique and pure, uh, no, pure po po in poétique. Then there's this adjective sonore, sonorous, resounding, right? So I chose profound because I already had the sounds, uh, you know, notion with, with tones. Okay, so I wanted that sequence of three P sounds, these plosives. Um, and then there's the issue of rhyme. So many of the poems rhyme. They don't really sort of rhyme perfectly because if they rhyme perfectly, you have to make them cheesy and bad. Um, so there's some slant rhymes. This is some pretty good rhyming here I've managed to do. Um, I have dark and spark. So dark is an adjective corresponding to noir, l'avenir apparaît moins noir. The future seems less dark. It's also the color black in French. And then this last line, son offrant radieux d'espoir, where the final word is the word for hope. Um, so espoir et noir, well that rhyme doesn't work. So I've been able to flip it around and have dark and spark, which gives an opposition, right? It's a, it's a binary opposition. And you're going to see a lot of that in my translations. Really, it's not too far from, from the literal, but I've got dark and spark. So I have about, um, so these are some, some of my guiding principles and we've got an example of the hope for this poetic activism. I've got about 15 minutes and I'm gonna be able to take a look at a couple of poems. I put, I put four in my slides, knowing that I wouldn't be able to, to get to all of them. Um, so I'm gonna choose a little bit. I'm gonna go back to my slide share. Um, okay. So I'm gonna move on. Well, I have three questions here I'm gonna answer. I'm gonna answer one of them and I can plant some questions for you later. I wanna answer question number three, where are the women? Because you're not on, you're gonna see men writing. One of the names of the poet, of the, the, the that were published was a woman's name, Lilia, who was Adolf Duhau's deceased sister. And this is sort of the influence of spiritualism, communicating with the dead. He was a spiritualist with many others. Um, all of the published poets in French are men. In the English side of the paper, there are some uh, female poets. So I'm going to tell you something. The women they were busy getting things done during this time of activism and transformation. They were fundraising, they were organizing, they were doing public speaking, they were doing a world of things. They were not getting their writings published. I am convinced, so there are some reasons and we can come back to, there is a conservative bent to the gender dynamics of this poetry and in the larger stance of the Creole activists. Unlike in the North, in Louisiana, feminism, and anti-slavery are not linked as it was in the North, right? Um, 
that doesn't mean that they're you know sort of misogynistic. Now there is some sort of classic misogyny and you know in the writings, um, you know patriarchy. Um, but I am convinced. I'm going to plant this out there that there's a treasure trove of manuscripts of women's writing that needs to be brought to light. So I hope that that happens. We can come back to this in the questions of some people like. Um, I'm going to do a couple of poems here, and then we're going to we're going to wrap up. Um, the first poem I want to look at is um, a, a poem heavily influenced by spiritualism, this new religion that involved communicating with the dead. And it is pub, um, uh, it's called Ignorance, L'Ignorance. And it's the, it's the very first poem published in the very first issue of L'Union. And it is by Henri Louis Rey, who was born in 1831 to parents from colonial era Haiti, Saint-Domingue, who came to New Orleans as refugees, married in New Orleans. Um, he, uh, as a young man, worked at a bookbinder and as a clerk. He was later on a soldier um, in the Louisiana Native Guards. He corresponded with the newspapers and he became a very important um, medium, spiritualist medium. He discovers his gift of communicating with the dead before the Civil War and after the Civil War, he founds a circle called the Cercle Harmonique, about which a couple of books have been written. They're there on the screen. And he has left an enormous collection at the University of New Orleans of registers, communications from the dead. And you have a drawing here that he drew of the ascent of the soul through spiritualism. Um, so I can talk a little about these other books later, but I wanna to get to his poem um, as I see time uh, moving along. So his poem is called ignorance, and I'm going to read the English, um, and you're going to see sort of his, his goal, what he wants to see in the world. It is the bane of humanity. It is the gnawing worm that feeds that which in all times impedes and seeks to muzzle liberty. Galileo stood accused because its laws were applied, as is science still refused and utter nonsense deified. It was by decree of ignorance that Jesus, our divine witness, received a wrongful sentence for wanting human progress. That Joan of Arc, Socrates, and other apostles of truth, Swedenborg, Columbus, were either mocked or put to death. Yes, in political affairs, in religious and social domains, as well as in artistic matters, unchallenged ignorance reigns. Tis the hand that snuffs out science, tis the cause of each and every loss, the true hell of human existence, the sole Satan in the cosmos. But judgment will come, clear and loud, from this enlightened age of ours, for reason, rising, free and proud, increasingly extends its powers. Its solemn courts will soon release the terms of truth's decree, freedom, universal peace, happiness, and harmony. What matters it that cannons roar, that all around an open tomb yawns, for tis the end of one bad world, as much more beautiful dawns. So a couple of notes on this, on this text are the, the links to um, figures in the past. Um, so he's, uh, Ray is envisioning, envisioning current challenges within the larger arc of human progress. He talks about Jesus, Joan of Arc, and Columbus, um, a little controversial to, today. And there's a direct reference to the war with the cannons, right? The cannons roaring. So for him, this is a revolutionary struggle. And he says, none of this matters, right? Because another much more beautiful world is, is coming. Um, one last note on this poem before I move into a second example and then, uh, and then conclude. This poem is republished in 1860. Five, a few weeks after Abraham Lincoln's assassination. And it has a couple of changed stanzas, stanza six. So 1865 is, is, when, is, a, is a time when there's a lot of concern about the former Confederates coming to power and nothing really changes. And he change, he's discussing ignorance in the stanza and he changes it. He writes, um, and you can read, look at the French on the left, for those of you who read French, tis the thing that spawns all crimes, the South slavery and their rights in italics are quotes, the blood of thousands of victims soaks the soil in thousands of sites. So he makes this much more immediate. Um, the last poem I'm going to discuss is a, is, is a Veterans Day special, um, an homage um, for all veterans everywhere, and specifically the Black soldiers of the Native Guards, one of whom 
Andre Caillou was born enslaved, emancipated himself with the consent of his, of his master at the age of 21, worked as a cigar maker and became a national hero when he died um, on the battlefield. This is a drawing um, that was published a few weeks later at the siege of Port Hudson, part of the Mississippi River campaigns whereby the Union tried to cut the South in, the, in, in two and, and New Orleans was part of that in 1862. This is in 1863. Um, so Andre Caillou um, is, is very well known at this time because he was one of the, he was one of the first black soldiers to die in the service of, of the United States. States of our, of, of our country. Um, and he, uh, his courage um, was reported in newspapers and it inspired um, a, a young man who was a planter, a free planter of color from a slave owning family in Pointe Coupe Parish, not too far from Fort, Fort Hudson, Emile Honoré, um, to write a poem in honor of André Caillou. Um, and uh, so a couple of notes about Emile Honoré, um, during and after the war, he becomes very involved in politics. And at the end of Reconstruction, that second phase, um, well, a couple of things. He's elected to the state legislature in 1868. So after the, the, the constitution, um, he becomes the first black sheriff of Point Coupe Parish. And he is later secretary of state at the end of Reconstruction um, during that time when the aims for a better world come crashing down. And you can see on the right that caricature um, by Thomas Nast that talks about how the situation now is worse than slavery. But back in 1863, he's living not far from the battlefield. And on July 4th, Independence Day, uh, which is very interesting because at this time, uh, André Caillou died on May 27th and his body is still lying in the field on July 4th. It hasn't been able to be recovered. The siege ends five days later on July 9th, a couple of days after Vicksburg is also taken by the Union. Um, on July 4th, um, this poem is, is, is published. I'm gonna read it, um, a couple of notes, and then we'll move into our conclusion. Um, What's this? You weep for the brave captain whose worth will astonish Port Hudson. But when he fell on that naked plain, he laid to rest a vile suspicion. Let us take heart, we men of his race. Before God alone did he deign to bow. May whites and blacks follow the noble ways of courageous André Caillou, and it would be sung twice. Yes, there amidst bombs and bullets spray, this hero of countenance, black and proud, guided the way through the battle's fray for his black brothers with iron courage endowed. There, facing the fire of the enemy's lines, as death whistled by in fullest view, his soldiers reborn a thousand times, all followed André Caillou. My God, what ardor. What lofty courage, without any aid in this bloody combat, they cause the foe to quiver in rage, then Banks salutes the saviors of our state. Six times they charged for victory, a thousand cannons shot them through. These hallowed dead in the house of glory still follow André Caillou. O oh, Liberty, our mother behold, all that your children can henceforth do. You open to them your sacred fold for the union's doubts have proven untrue. Soon vanquished, these unworthy rebels, thirsty for blood of your greatness jealous, will vanish or will become loyal by a hundred thousand Cayuse. Well, a couple of remarks on, on this poem. There's this reference to convincing Banks, who was the general, um, the commander in charge of Louisiana, Nathaniel Banks, who had a lot of doubts about black troops in battle, as did the nation in general. And um, this, André Caillou specifically, but this particular charge, even though it was not successful, so this day of battle, was heralded in newspapers across the country as proving that Black troops could, would, and could fight and do so heroically. And Caillou giving up his life was sort of a martyr for that, for that greater cause. So in the introduction, I'm very interested in racial identity and how it's portrayed blacks and whites. Only Caillou, it was reported, had dark skin and was very proud of it um, as, as a French speaking man from New Orleans. And so what's important about this poem, I discuss some of the philosophy between, uh, be, be, behind the notions of binaries, right? Black and white. They should be equal, but as we know, separate doesn't mean equal, right? We've learned that in our country. So André Caillou is a black leader is very important. And it says whites and blacks will follow him. 
most of the Native Guard's officers were whites. So if you have a white officer, even though there are black and white troops together, perhaps, that doesn't really change the hierarchy because a white man is still in charge. White men have always been in charge. But when you have a black officer in charge of black and white men, the binary is, is therefore not necessarily flipped, but that's when it becomes equal. Because if it's always whites in charge, it's not equal, right? Um, so I hope that you will read um, the poems themselves. It's also some of my explanations and certainly that you're gonna come up with your own. Um, there are other poems I would love to discuss. Um, uh, poems, some of which I, I discovered, you find, you know, they're, they're all in the book. Um, if you're a part of any other groups out there, you know, civic groups, community groups, I love discussing this stuff. Uh, so I'm going to move into a concluding point um, now that uh, we've gotten to see some, you know, some work from three of these, of these several poets. When I come back, you're going to see me skip through. Oh, look at all this interesting stuff um, that I have in sort of my general presentation. So I'm going to, um, this is a photo I took back in, in May of 2017. As, as, you, as most of you may know, um, uh, three years ago, a little more now, um, there was action by the city government to remove uh, Confederate monuments that were erected after the Civil War and that were seen by many as an affront um, and as an, a symbolic obstacle to racial healing and, and reconciliation. Um, so I was there actually for two monuments, uh, General Bo, uh, Beauregard's um, equestrian statue in front of the New Orleans Museum of Art, and then a couple of days, which was way late at night, um, pretty tense atmosphere. And then a couple of days later in broad daylight, um, uh, General Lee atop, from atop his column uh, in Tivoli Square. And I really like this picture because uh, I, don't, I do not know this woman. I do not know her baby, right? She's an adult sort of looking at the statue, watching this happen. This kid's off looking at something else, right? He's watching a butterfly. He's looking at people. You know, he, he's, you know he's, moved on, he's moving on. Um, but I think that right now in 2020, clearly there are a lot of events showing that we haven't moved on enough and we haven't found the strategies to, to heal together. It is my firm belief that these poems have a role to play in that. Um, and that, uh, so again, as I said in the beginning, I really wanna convince everyone that these activists, artists um, who were involved in the politics of their day, those politics are behind us, but this literary legacy is still here. So as we have um, removed some of the blemishes um, from, our, from our past, there, there, there are conversations going on and initiatives on how, what can we, you know, what can we do to enrich our understanding of the past? And again, I, I really think that these, these, these poets and their works should be a, a part of that conversation. So I'm going to leave you on that note. Um, I'm going to say merci, uh, thank you to Anastasia and all the organizers. And I'm very much looking forward to the questions that will hopefully flood in. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bruce. So um, we have a lot of good questions. Um, you really enlightened um, us about the, the whole translation process. I'm most surprised um, that it takes eight to 10 hours to translate eight to 10 lines <laughs> of French poetry. So um, to that regard, thank you so much. Um, my background is in African diasporic studies. And so um, if it weren't for uh, the translations of, of French um, writers such as, you know, Amé Cesar, you know, I wouldn't, you know, it, we, uh, as a field, we would have access to, you know, sort of those um, pan-Africanist, you know, sort of point of view of, of the, just in general, the rest of the African diaspora. So um, thank you for translating, translating that. Um, and it really puts, you know, sort of this, this idea of translation into context. It's, it's way more than just translating, you know, there's certain motives behind it, so on and so forth. So I think um, I'm thankful for, for you to contribute that for sure. So the first question that came through, 
was, um, let's see. I was curious if you heard of Adam Isaacs Minkin, who grew up in Mil Milburg or Milburg, Milburg. <laughs> Apparently, he had one book of poetry published and was involved in um, Alexandra Dumas, but had a reputation that wasn't exactly positive. I think your mic is off, Dr. Bruce. It's still not working now. Hello. I heard it for a second. I heard it for a second, but no. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so I switched to my computer mic. Uh, that's okay, you don't need to know these technical details, but I may <laughs> move forward so that it's a little clearer. I, I wanted to um, just quickly follow up. Um, so. Uh, I'm not sure what you heard me say. Did you hear me talk about my own background at all? You heard nothing. Okay, we'll, we'll clear this up. So I, I, first of all, I started off by saying, no, I have not uh, heard of this reference. Uh, and I'm always curious to um, gain, enrich my own repertoire. Uh, so if the person who asked that question feels that it would be helpful to me and my own understanding, uh, feel free to get in touch with me. I'll put my contact back information back up. I saw that Melissa Daggett, who is the author of a wonderful book about Henri-Louis Rey that I flashed on the screen earlier, requested that. I'm easy to find. Uh, 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 so something I want, I want to mention that, um, you know, since you discussed your own background, Anastasia, I'm very much a Francophone scholar. Most historians have spent time looking at the English papers. I spent a lot more time in the French language papers and in French language documents. So I didn't talk much about the Louisiana French literary tradition. Um, I mentioned the Sinel, that earlier collection. And I'm very much a, a Francophone scholar. Um, so, you know, that's, you know, that's part of what I bring, but that can also be, um, you know, perhaps a limitation in some ways. But I do very much believe that these poets are pioneers of Aimé Césaire, the poet from Martinique that you mentioned, and some of the French language um, uh, visionaries, philosophers, artists, writers of the 20th century uh, for me, in part because of their Haitian connection, which is a common influence. Thank you. Will, um, let's see. So um, were or are there differences regarding both writings and responses <clears throat> to these pieces in terms of human variables like urban uh, New Orleans proper versus rural intellectual versus the less educated residents um, and Creoles versus Cajuns categories that are common, albeit not altogether accurate or appropriate? That's a really fascinating, um, I want, I'm gonna say can of worms to start off with um, because there's so much there in the worldview of, of these writers. I'm gonna start off by, by maybe uh, making a linguistic note. As many of you know, there is a Louisiana Creole language that is distinct from, but resembles in some ways, Haitian Creole and other Creoles spoken in the former French empire. 
these poets, as most New Orleanians, certainly of um, you know French or Creole background, would have known and spoken the Louisiana Creole language, and it would have been associated with um, street life, folk tales, uh, a whole cultural world. They did not write in this language. Um, theirs is a very educated poetry. They do view themselves, the terms they use for themselves, um, you know, in the newspaper, how they see themselves identifying. You saw some examples in the in the in the poems. Um, uh, they would often refer to themselves as Louisianians, uh, Louisiane, um, sometimes as, as Creoles, um, sometimes as as Negroes, sometimes as Black. Um, it, it really depends. Sometimes there are terms like Franco-African. Um, but so so by and large, the, the writers themselves uh, are educated francophones who live in Louisiana. That's their local frame frame of reference. And as far as the sort of cultural mix in Louisiana, there is not a lot of, um, so how can I say, certainly not in the poems, there is not a lot of delving into the the cultural diversity of Louisiana. I mean, they're an important part of it. And what they bring is a really, you know, a key element to it. There are a couple of poems that use different vernacular, more oral speech. Um, I could share a funny one right now during the questions, but I don't want to keep uh, that's th th actually in, in my longer version of the slides. Um, but most of the folks, so I'm going to sort of get to my point here. As far as sort of the Cajun identity, this is, I'm not saying they're not aware of um, white country folk, you know, country folk mostly who identified back then as, as, as Cadien, that word did exist. Um, and, and the English word Cajun was coming to be more and more known. They were certainly aware of this population, but it's not necessarily who their, um, you know, the writers themselves are, are in dialogue with. In the 19th century, most of the folks who were interested in vernacular um, sort of um, dialects, they are white folklorists, and they sometimes use that in a very racist approach. Um, one example is during the second sort of half of Reconstruction, there was a super racist newspaper, Le Carillon, that published a lot in Louisiana Creole. And they also, alongside racist caricatures of um, black political figures. So it's really used to show um, uh, Louisiana Creole speakers is uneducated, even though many of those people, as you can see, their style of writing is highly educated. On a less vicious note, um, there are folklorists in the 19th century who start collecting, you know, folk tales, proverbs in, in Louisiana Creole out of admiration and also for preservation purposes. And we still have those documents. Um, there can be racist tinges to it, but it's not undertaken, you know, in that in that vein. So I haven't answered all the elements of that question. I can say that, you know, today, um, the I'm in the word, the, the term Creole can start arguments, right? What does that mean? Um, I'm in Facebook groups where people go off for hundreds of comments. Um, it's been a heavily, you know, it's, it's been invested racially in lots of different ways. I largely try to avoid that discussion in my presentation by latching on to the more scholarly term Afro-Creole. And I'll let you know, readers, community members do with that you know, what they will. I'm not here as a scholar and translator to tell people you know, how they should be you know, identifying, labeling, labeling themselves. There you go. Thank you. Next question. As you've noted spiritualism, to what extent did African diasporic spiritual and religious traditions, um, such as voodoo, voodoo, hoodoo, uh, syncretic um, Catholicism, and the Orisha tradition play a role and inform the sociopolitical movements and activism by free, free people of color and other formerly enslaved communities in New Orleans and greater Louisiana? Sure. Um, that's a, 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 the question is extremely, extremely logical, and I may not be the best person to answer it, but I can give sort of what I've gathered from some more specialized research, including the two books that I flashed on the, on the screen earlier. On the surface, there is not a lot of direct influence in, in um, on spiritualism of these um, sort of more vernacular uh, religious practices that certainly existed and certainly played a large role in New Orleans mystique for one and in the, and in the lives of people. That is certainly not to deny that. And if you look in the newspapers in the 1860s, actually I'll have accounts of um, the police busting up 
um, uh, voodoo rituals, uh, for, for example. Um, you know, so this is this is present in in the in the press. I do suspect, and I think some of the more uh, you know scholars um, would certainly not deny that the the current of, of beliefs that were expressed in New Orleans, you know, New Orleans voodoo. There is contact with Haiti. Um, there is some some evidence that folks who traveled to Haiti, who were part of this activist circle, um, were um, did gain familiarity with Haitian voodoo. There's certainly no denying that this communication, um, you know, and the, the role of communicating with the other world is is there as a strong undercurrent. In in what we have as far as documentation, it's very much philosophical and mystical spiritualism as as influenced, uh, uh, you know, sort of as created um, by uh, mystical theologians and, and philosophers. So I'd say that it's an underground current and it's not one that really comes out in the poetry. Thank you. So next question. Um, we have uh, Mr. Mark Rudinay joining us um, and this is his question. Thank you for joining us, um, Mark. It's somewhat silly to pick a favorite from so many wonderful poems. Nevertheless, I keep returning to Au Pair. Chocal. Yes. <laughs> if you had to choose one poem to feature, what would it be? <laughs> that is a very tough question, uh, Mr. Houdane, although I will say I'm truly touched by, by your choice because that's a, I would send everyone there. Um, Au Pair Chocarne is a denunciation of discriminatory practices um, in the Catholic Church, and it it should shake you to your core. There should be a, a, a real chord that vibrates in your in your heart. Um, so I do sort of toggle. Maybe it sort of depends on my, on my mood. Um, Adolphe uh, Duart, whom I you know I quoted an excerpt of his. He is a masterful literary artist. And so there are probably some of his that I could say are are my favorites. Um, he um, he wrote several tragic poems. There's also a funny poem that he that I discovered at the Boston Athenaeum uh, in some rarely consulted issues, including by Mr. Houdinet. I know he's been there to see them. Uh, that appears here really for the first time. Um, there is a poem that he wrote in the summer of 1864. He and his wife Odelia lost three young daughters who passed away. And he wrote a poem after that, that's title is their three first names, Belt, Lucie, Marie. And I do not believe that you can read that. It's a long howl of mourning. Um, it's a long poem with short lines. My editor read it and said she cried. Um, I do not believe that you can read that poem um, truly and, and be quite the same person afterwards if you really commune with his pain. Um, I won't say that's my favorite poem, so I'm gonna I'm gonna answer the question very very quickly uh, with the right to change at a different Q and A later on. Um, as as you know, Mr. Houdini and may others know, I got very interested and in and in the a terrible incident that occurred in, in late July of 1866, a massacre at the Constitutional Convention that should have produced what came out later in the 1868 Constitution, where nearly 50 people died in an incident of, of, of mass racist violence um, under the uh, watch and with the participation of the New Orleans police. Um, so that's a day that will live in infamy July 30th. Uh, the Tribune was involved in the inquiries afterwards, reporting on what happened. And, and as you know, Mr. Houdini and others, I actually found some uh, lost issues that people believe didn't exist and I'm working on an article about them. Some wonderful poems came out of those. Um, and so I think that probably one of my very favorites is by the, the anonymous, there's a name, Camille Noudin, his Ode to the Martyrs, um, uh, where he uh, really, uh, a year later, it's published a year later as they're organizing the first anniversary of the 1866 massacre. I think that's probably my favorite poem. It was both mournful, it condemns hypocrisy. The very last line talks about the irony of these people who were killed being dead while Jefferson Davis still walks the earth. <laughs> so it has a condemnatory tone. So uh, I think it's a true masterpiece. So there's a there's a long-winded but still direct answer. Ode to the Martyrs, Odo Martia. Thank you. 
Uh, Dr. Bruce, thank you for your talk. I'm wondering if there are contemporary Catholic spiritualist churches that you know about here in New Orleans. I do not, and I'm not the person to ask, but I would imagine there are some great um, Creole culture Facebook groups, um, some of which I'm, I'm, in, I'm involved in, but I wouldn't be the person where you could probably go ask that question fairly uh, uh, fairly easily. Melissa Daggett, who uh, pub published uh, uh, a question, popped up, whose question popped up earlier, um, may know of contemporary spiritualists, and that could be a conversation. You could maybe get in contact with some folks like her who've researched that, or a Facebook group, you know, ask the collective brain, as we say. Thank you. I love how you wrote in your introduction that Camille Naudin and others use language quote, to cast loss in terms of historical progress. I think that's very, in, I think that's uh, a very interesting concept. Can you elaborate? So um, I have to think back on where I, I, I wrote that, but yes, that's, so there was a lot of violence and death going on at this, at this time, right? I think that's sort of come out. I just mentioned the 1866 massacre. Um, the, the, the battles, you know, Andre Caillou and others dying on the battlefields. Um, and the, the journalists themselves, you know, including, you know, Louis Charles uh, Roudene, his staff, uh, Paul Trevigne, um, other, other poets, you know, who would go to the Tribune offices, the, the journalists, they walked in the valley of the shadow of death for years, right? Um, and, um, you know, and then there's, you know, death is more present in other ways, you know, disease, epi epi epidemics. Um, I mean, they're literally ri risking their lives every day to get out the news from, from their, you know, their perspective to promote causes and to defend, you know, their viewpoints, uh, you know, using the press as a community organizing tool. So I, I you know, I, so I think at some point, and especially spending a lot of time with these poems, and then also with other texts, editorials in the newspaper, um, death notices, and I'm going to fin this on a really clear example uh, in just a second. You know, I, I believe, you know, these are real blows to real human beings who, um, uh, who had to, had to, you know, wake up in the morning and, and think, you know, I've got to go teach my classes at the, <laughs> at the, the, the Catholic Institute, you know, I've got to go to work as a, as a printer, I've got to go to work as a, as a brick, you know, as a mason. Uh, and then I'm going to go participate in a fundraiser in a committee meeting. Uh, so I think that, for the, you know, the poetry is a way of, of making sense. So I've, I've, I've put it in some more concrete terms um, as a way, as I've said, of using these poems to look at the present and to try to project the future. I think that was hard on a day-to-day -day basis because we all know that it can be hard on a day-to-day -day basis now with this pandemic, with all sorts of things we're dealing with, right? So we need those points of light that, uh, that, that, that draw us. And among the poems that I discovered, I said I'd end on a concrete example, uh, at the Boston Athenaeum in some rarely discovered issues from 1868 is a beautiful elegy to Armand Lanus, whom I mentioned earlier. He's from an earlier generation of writers born around 1812, um, who was the, uh, the principal of the school um, that, that's come up a number of times and so in the mentor to, to generations um, of, of the Creole community, Amon Lanus, and he edits this collection of poetry. He passes away in, in March, I believe March 16th, 1868, his death, it's a, a sort of a surprise. He's on the school board at the time. Um, and um, Adolphe Duart, the poet who wrote, you know, 30, 36 poems in the collection, has a poem that's whose title is exclamation point. That's just it. Um, and uh, again, it's, it's much like his, in some ways, like his, um, uh, his uh, ode to his three children who passed away. It is painful, but he imagines he, he looks back at Amon Lanus's legacy and says, your voice is still with us. And if you could speak today, the people would still 
follow you. We respect you so much. And so this is kind of a concrete example of this recent, he actually comes out, the poem comes out two days later. He's clearly up at night writing his poem it is, it is in a space of grief where he needs to get this out. And he doesn't leave it in his notebook. He doesn't just read it to his wife, Odelia, or his friends. He puts it in the newspaper for the community. And now it's, it's there for us, right? This feeling. But literally, you know, he really says, you will stay with us. And as a spiritualist, he would believe that he was with us, uh, you know, literally, um, but in a more metaphorical sense as well. That's sort of a long answer, but I hope that I fleshed that out in a satisfactory way. Thank you. I'm gonna like uh, group some things together. Um, folks have been asking about direct contact information for you. Um, and, all, and I know you put that in your last slide. Um, and we're almost out of time, but also someone else wanted to know, um, this isn't the last question, but just wanting to see um, what you would say, um, will the slide deck be temporary, temporarily available for registrants? We can do that. I have, I personally have not been, that's something we can discuss afterwards. Like I said, I had some extra material, uh, depending on which poems I wanted to choose. I gave myself some choices, you know, to see how the spirit would move me. Um, I may remove those that weren't actually reflected in the talk because there are other elements of my research I'll want to pull out later. So I'll um, clean it up, check it for typos. Uh, and, um, I, you know, if it's, it, yeah, we can discuss the details of that afterwards. Um, okay. Sure one maybe one final note. Um, I'm easy to find. Uh, my Facebook is semi-professional. You will see, you know, photos of my cat if you find me. Um, <laughs> I don't know how many people are out are out there, but if anyone actually wants to um, connect and see things that I share, I certainly don't mind. You know, you could always send me a note and say hi. Uh, you know, hi Clint. You can use my first name, right? Um, uh, I, you know, I listened to your talk. I'd love to stay in touch. I do that with people, journalists, other researchers. Um, I'm very amenable to that. But if someone wants to shoot me an email. Um, just to say hi or ask a, you know, a follow up, um, meet up when I'm in New Orleans. Sure. With pleasure. Thank you. So the last question is, have you found any women in the lives of these Creole writers that you know for sure was a writer herself? Hmm. Oh, okay. I can, I mean, I can say almost with certainty that some of the, um, women to whom a couple of poems are um, dedicated were surely writing because their intellect is being discussed and their public speaking skills are being dis discussed. I'm gonna hold back on my answer a little bit because I don't wanna say any wrong names. I think I might give a name and confuse. Uh, I, I just wanna be safe in what I say since this is being recorded. I'm gonna give a, a so one person that I'm thinking of is Nathalie Fomanto, who is, um, a young woman who was a teacher and is connected uh, as a friend to a number of these poets. She was, uh, um, she is presented as sort of a muse um, uh, in an, a, a more than one poem actually. Is it two, is it, is it four? She, that she receives some dedications of poetry. She's very present, Nathalie uh, Fomento. And, um, so the, another poet who was also a, uh, a principal and a professor of modern languages, Joanny Kesti, one of my favorite writers, also wrote some short stories as well. He has a poem where he, de he dedicates to her and really goes at length about how much he admires her, her intellect. It's sort of an intellectual conversation, but it's a monologue, right? There are some hints in there where I think surely she was doing some writing, but it hasn't been published. Uh, so I want some folks who are maybe in New Orleans to start looking through some notebooks, you know, looking through their attics and do the next step. The, the New, historic New Orleans collection is, uh, I'll speak a bit about my editors, producing right now a spate of fantastic books on 19th century New Orleans. Um, Fatima Sheikh has a wonderful book that will be coming out this in a few months about um, the Société d'Economie and Economy Hall, a fraternal organization uh, that was also a hotspot of early jazz through the 20th century. Some of those families, um, you know, maybe she's seen some poems. I don't, I don't know, but I'm sure, I'm sure that these women um, were writing, and I see some hints in some of the poems. Thank you. Um, we are out of time. I'm I'm aware that I am going over a few minutes after 
uh, 7.30, um, but I wanted to get that question because I'm so grateful you all used the chat feature. And so uh, you all liked uh, that last question. So I had to answer it because it was multiple of you that sort of uh, liked that question. So um, I wanted to make sure we put that one in. Additionally, um, we will be sending uh, an email detailing a lot of these things that we discussed, including some of the resources um, that you all have requested of Dr. Clint. Um, in addition to that, the survey and um, the link for the um, recording that's going on now. So I just wanna let you all know, please be on the lookout for that follow-up email from Zoom. Um, and that is it. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Clint, for your time. Um, and your, your book sounds amazing. So um, you all also will have um, access to that link um, where, to, where to buy his book. You can just also go to the Historic New Orleans uh, Collections website, but we will also include that link as well where you can purchase uh, Dr. Clint's book. Thank you all so much and you have a great night.